welcome to the Texas A&M University College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs Continuing Video Conference Series. Today, we're talking about a career worth barking about, Veterinary Technicians 101. Mary Erskine from the Small Animal Teaching Hospital will be talking to us today about how she became a veterinary technician. What does it take to get into school? What is school like? And then, what is a day in the life of a veterinary technician like? We welcome you and hope you enjoy the program. Hello. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to let you know a little bit about me. Again, my name is Mary Erskine, and I work at Texas A&M Small Animal Hospital. And so as you can see, I have a lot of photos of all of my children on the first slide, and I'll kind of let you know a little bit about them. Um, all of my animals are rescues or have been taken in from a hospital I've worked at over the last few years, and so they all have their own special background towards them. Um, let's start with the dogs. I have a Border Collie Blue Healer mix named Oakley. He is five, and I got him in Washington State. I have an Irish Wolfhound who is one year and two months old, and I got him from Texas A&M Small Animal Hospital when he came into the hospital. I have two rescue kitties that came in hit by cars um, at a hospital in Denver, Colorado that I worked at. And then I have a rehab bunny named Little Nugget. And he came in and his back legs don't work very well. And then last but not least, I have a horse by the name of Dakota, who <laughs> luckily has no problems other than he loves Western riding. So that's a little bit about my animals and a little bit of my family, I should guess. Okay, um, now let's talk about where did I go to school um, and to get my two years associate's degree in veterinary technology. Um, I'm from Washington State and in that area around Spokane, there's not very many um, technician schools at the time when I was applying. And so I decided to look around and I found one in Colorado, Denver, by the name of Bell Ray and it had great ratings and I thought it would be a great change. So I packed up everything and headed off to Denver, Colorado, where I attended Bell Ray for two years. Um, and, um, and then I applied for a for an internship at Texas A&M at the end of my two year. Okay, so my experience was phenomenal at Bell Ray. Some of my favorite courses were microbiology, parasitology, and hematology. And these are more um, microscope classes, I should say, where I'm looking down at something and hoping to be able to identify it and also know how did the animal get this or how do we treat this. Um, so really, it's more, my experience with the microscope was very enjoyable because it was very hands-on. So that was my favorite classes, but there was tons of classes. What, can you tell us what you were looking at in microbiology, parasitology, and hematology? Yes, okay, so a microbiology, you're looking at bacteria. As you can see, one of those pictures with the white glove, you're looking to see what's going to grow on that culture slide. And then you take that bacteria, you scoop some of it up, put it on a slide, look under the scope, and see, okay, this is the bacteria, and then you go into figuring out how did the animal get this bacteria and how to treat this bacteria. Um, and so then with parasitology, you're taking um, maybe an ear swab from an animal and you're rubbing that swab on a slide and looking under the scope and seeing little crawlies and you know maybe the dog or cat has ear mites or something to that nature. You're taking a tick off of them and putting the tick under the scope and seeing what exactly kind of tick that is and where they would have got that from. So parasitology is more creepy crawlies. And um, hematology is you're taking blood, and you're taking blood from the patient, you're making a thin slide of that blood, looking under the scope, and then you're kind of looking at platelets and the form of the blood or the blood cells and seeing if there's anything inside those blood cells that there shouldn't be, any kind of toxins that would pop up on, on that slide. Um, so that's hematology, it's all blood-based mostly. So those are the three different Okay, so these are lab classes as well, as well. but at Bell Array, you don't just take lab classes. They're associated with um, lecture classes, but um, radiology, of course, that's where we're taking an animal and we're putting them under an x-ray unit and checking out, seeing um, after we take an x-ray what the bones and things like that look like 
And then um, veterinary medicine, one through four, those are basic lecture classes that just go into deep conversation about how to properly handle patients and and everyday life as a technician more in those kind of class, more in those classes, I should say. Like the instructor, instructors are telling you about personal experiences, but they're also making sure you understand the rules between a veterinary technician's responsibility and a doctor's responsibility, and not trying to blend the two. Um, and then you can go into anesthesia. I really enjoy anesthesia because you get to learn about all different types of machines and protocols, and, um, and it's really hands-on. So anesthesia is a lot of fun. A um, little stressful, I mean, we do have a patient under anesthesia and their life is at stake, you know, you're keeping them alive and stuff, so, but it's still very rewarding when they wake up from after everyone, hopefully. And then you have anatomy and physiology, which um, you're going through and you're looking at muscles and bones and you're learning about them, and um, so yeah, just the basic fundamentals about the, the structure of animals. And then um, we're going to do some medical math. Math was never my fun subject in school, I can tell you that. But um, medical math is different. You were able to take the patient that you were working with and its weight, and you're using certain formulas to calculate how much fluid that patient should get while it's in the hospital, or certain feeding um, calorie intake and things like that. So medical math is very different than regular algebra or school math. I mean, you still need to know how to you know, times your numbers, but it's much more simple. And then you have exotics. Um, these ones, that was always a little creepy crawly class for me just because things with scales were never my, my um, favorite class, but definitely was rewarding. I got to learn all about snakes and lizards and, um, and all, of, all those different kind of species that I didn't know much about. A lot about birds and all that stuff and how to feed a bird. <laughs> Um, that was a very hands-on class, and so that's what I loved about Bell Ray a lot was it's very hands-on. Um, we got to always work on patients, and so that was great. And then you can go to large, an we had large animal lab classes where we were able to learn about horses, the anatomy, the different types of breeds. Um, so a lot of the basic fundamentals when it came to large animals and all different types of large animals. And then um, dentistry, which is very important. Um, so we get to learn the whole bone structure and, um, <laughs> sorry, about teeth and um, how to properly take care of them, how to clean them, what instruments to use on teeth. So yeah, that was just another class to add to it. So those are some of the classes. Those aren't all of them by any means. Okay, so um, after all the studying and finals and dedication and passion I had to become the best technician I could be, um, if you graduate at a pretty high GPA after two years, um, the school allows you to send out applications around different, um, different hospitals around the U.S. And so I sent an application for an internship out to Texas A&M, and that's where I got accepted. So I spent 10 weeks traveling around Texas A&M, small animal and large animal hospital, learning about all the different specialty, or specialty departments and um, I loved it. And so afterwards, I applied for a, diff a few different positions and landed a job at first, which led me to um, small animal and large animal anesthesia at Texas A&M. But then I decided I loved anesthesia, but I wanted to mix it up some. So I went ahead and took a job in small animal internal medicine, which is, um, I'll kind of go into more detail, of course, about internal medicine when it comes to general practice, um, veterinarians, as soon as their clients are kind of stumped at a point where they don't know what to do for their animal anymore, that general practice, they sometimes will refer them to Texas A&M. That way they can get a more in-depth diagnostic. And so what internal medicine does is we see a lot of um, respiratory problems and nasal discharge, um, hyper hypothyroidism, diabetes, um, um, you see a lot of diarrhea, vomiting, lethargic, lethargic um, CKD. Um, these are all very in-depth problems that take a lot of different diagnostics or even procedures to help cure these animals or at least make them more comfortable. Um, and then some other handy skills um, that I was able to obtain since I've been at Texas A&M, like I said at first, was um, I, was, I had training and experience in small and large animal anesthesia, 
And that way, now I can help internal medicine anesthetize cases when needed. So now we're going to talk about um, a day in the life of a technician. And this <laughs> some days you feel like this, where things are really hectic, and you've got 10 appointments, and five transfers, and you know your days just hit the ground running, and your hair is on fire. But a lot of times, you feel most, most of the time like this. You're really happy, and you're really proud to help these animals. Okay, so a day in the life of a technician consists of, first things first, I head down to ICU every morning to see all the new patients that were admitted through emergency and being transferred to internal medicine specialty department. And so what I do is I get down there to check on these patients, I obtain a history on them, and I begin to start calling the referring veterinarians to get um, medical records and everything faxed over for our, for our fourth year vet students and veterinarians to start reading through those histories. Okay, and then um, we're going to restrain the animal for examination, and by the doctor and the vet student, I'm gonna help them do this. And then also we're going to collect specimens and perform laboratory procedures, um, such as blood work, feces, urine. These are all going to be used for diagnostics. Um, we perform cystocentesis, which is um, with an ultrasound or through palpation to obtain the urine appropriately. And um, also we're going to start filling out paperwork. Um, a lot of these samples are going to be sent out to other labs, and so we need to make sure we're filling the appropriate forms out. And we need to also be aware of putting them in the correct tubes. And so next, we're going to restock and set up the room for all the following procedures. Like I said, we have transfers in the morning that we work on, but then we hit the ground running with about 9 to 10 appointments a day. And these are with cats or dogs. Um, so we're going to set up the room. And also, we're going to start looking through the histories on all the patients that are coming in. I want to make sure I can help the doctors to the best of my ability and also know um, become familiar with these animals when I see them and know who I'm working on. Okay, and then also we're going to send out um, maybe requests out to other departments in the hospital. So if I have, we have a patient coming in that needs to go to ultrasound or radiology, I want to make sure I can get all the requests sent out, call that department and figure out when are they going to want this patient and when should I bring them the patient, help them hold and further on diagnostics. Okay. Throughout the day, um, I work a lot with the fourth year vet students, and I help them. I help teach them how to restrain animals appropriately, and that way that their technicians don't get hurt down the road, and also that they don't get hurt too. So it's it's a process. Cats and dogs are very different, and the proper way to restrain them, you have to be shown multiple different types of way: sitting, laying down, all all of the ways. Um, so, and then we're going to also talk about blood draws, um, teaching students how to perform a good blood draw is great, but you also have to kind of understand what medication is this patient on. Um, if there's any platelet problems with, with the patient, you want to make sure you're not poking the biggest jugular, or <laughs> the biggest vessel, which is the jugular. You want to make sure that you know, you're poking a back leg and you're properly teaching the students these, this technique. Um, so, and then you also, we also do a lot with prepping patients for surgeries. Um, liver lap biopsies, bone aspirates, joint taps, these are all diagnostic tools to help treat the animals and help them with their illness. So um, we have to prep them by shaving them um, and then properly cleaning them as well with the proper technique. And then sometimes, as, te as a technician as well, we assist in endoscopy procedures, which this is where we take multiple different types of scopes and we go um, we go intro through the body, either through the stomach or the bladder, and we're helping to kind of get an idea of what's in there with the camera and seeing, or if we need to take biopsies or things like that. So um, right here, um, we help with setting up the procedure. We assist ne um, as needed to help run smoothly, and uh, we also clean up and resterilize the room after every procedure. Okay, so as I said, this is endoscopy, and an example is a cystoscopy with a laser ablation. As you can see in one of the pictures down there, um, there's it looks like white crystals. Um, sometimes we're able to go in through the bladder, and we take the laser in there, and we help um, break down those crystals so that the animal can maybe um, start to pee a little bit better, things like that. So, and then also we're going to remove foreign body material from the stomach with a different type of scope. 
and you can remove rocks, socks, hair ties, and having the having the scopes to our use, that way the animal isn't having to go back into the OR and, and into the OR and um, have to have these foreign materials taken out of them surgically. We're able to take our scopes down and help pull out these foreign bodies. So it um, sometimes can be much safer for the patients. But things tend to do get a little messy in this room, trust me. So as I said, as the technician, we um, it's not always just fun games. We do a lot of the setting up everything for the doctors to have these procedures run as smooth as they can. And then also we're in charge of <coughs> cleaning, re-sterilizing all of the equipment and then making sure for the next um, surgery that gets in there that they have everything they need. When you say messy, you don't mean unclean. No, 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 no. I mean, um, when I say messy, I'm saying, um, as you can tell from the picture, that it's just a bunch of chaoticness towards the end of it. So, no, not unclean. Everything is very sterile procedure while we're in there. Um, all in a day's work. Um, each day is fun and full of new cases and workups that um, the vet students and the veterinarians all work hard at coming up with what diagnostics they want to perform and what to do next. And the technicians um, were there to always help out with anything that the doctors may need. Um, there's always something new and exciting to learn about. And uh, we work as a team to try and help patients overcome their illness. But most of all, as a technician, um, I show animals love, compassion, and kindness to help make their experience less scary. Any questions? So we want to know, um, and we were talking about this earlier as well, how do you learn how to do the endoscopy or the anesthesia? Um, so you are trained by other technicians or supervisors um, that have worked in, to, in that field for a long time. I know um, when I was being trained in anesthesia, I was trained by um, specialized um, anesthesia technicians. And so, um, and then also you have your specialist um, veterinarians that work with the technicians to train them on the protocols they want them to use, what drug protocols and things like that. So you're being trained by very well experienced veterinarians and technicians for those two different things. So there are veterinary technician specialists as well? Yes, mm -hmm. yep, there are. Um, it's, uh, you have to have been in that specialty for three years before you can apply to take that test. But yes, you can become a specialist in, in multiple different um, different areas of veterinary medicine field. Do you have any specialty certification? I do not. Um, I'm actually hoping to apply for my internal medicine specialty, um, but I have to get a, a, about another year and a half on my belt before I really look into that. So. And what does an internal medicine specialty entail? Um, it's it's just for more internal problems associating with the animal. Um, so we're looking more at the endocrine system and um, just not your basic primary care needs. We're just looking at more in depth. How is the pancreas working? Um, how is our thyroid, the kidneys, things like that. You mentioned you work with veterinary students mm -hmm. uh, and maybe uh, help them with restraint of, of animals. Uh, how long do you have a given student and do you see uh, a big difference on the first day and the last day yes. uh, of, of, of that? Yes, um, with the veterinarian students, uh, they are with internal medicine for up to two weeks at a time and then sometimes they take their rotation twice, meaning they're with us for four weeks. So from the very first day we start working with them and, ex and explaining the proper ways to restrain these animals and by the end of their two week long rotation, you can see a great change in them. At least you hope to see a great change in them. But most of the time we do because we really push for, um, we are patient, we're patient advocates and we really push for them to um, learn as much as they possibly can from the technicians. So also when they go out into the world and work with other technicians, they might be able to show them a thing or two as well. Is it more re rewarding to work with a problem animal or uh, and to get it, get care to that animal versus one that just docile and easy? Um, I think it's good to work with both. Both That way you can get a break from the problem and the docile easy one. But um, it's like, uh, I guess the 
challenge is always kind of nice too when you feel like, okay, this could be a little bit of a uh, naughty kitty. And so how to properly restrain that kitty to where your technician and the student and the doctor are not hurt, that can be a challenge, but it's very rewarding when the animal is secure and is is also not hurt, no one is hurt, and that you're able to get your samples and you're able to help this animal even though it might have come off kind of naughty. At the end, it's mostly probably just scared. And most of the animals that come into the hospital, they're just scared even if they are categorized as being naughty or challenged. So you have to keep that in mind when you're restraining these animals is that um, you, you don't have to be forceful or anything. If you have the proper technique down, and these animals, should, you should easily be able to restrain them appropriately. What would be some early signs of a naughty kitty? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a naughty kitty, you're going to see um, maybe ears flat to their head. Their, um, their pupils and eyes are going to be very large. You may see some hissing. You may hear some growling. You're going to see them kind of backed up way far in their carrier. Um, or if they're in a cage, they're going to be crunched down in a corner. And they could be striking at you with a paw and claws um, or charging at you even. Uh, those are big indicators that your kitty's probably a little scared or doesn't want to be handled. So you need to make sure you're using the proper technique as whichever your hospital uses, Texas A&M, we um, definitely prefer um, the towels. Yes? Uh, we have two questions. Okay. One is, what's your work schedule like? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. It depends. When I worked in anesthesia, my schedule was a little bit more hectic because you are on call. Because you're going to get called in in the middle of the night for um, multiple different types of cases, like anything that came through emergency that needs to be anesthetized. So um, through anesthesia, my hours might have been 8 to 5, but if I'm on call, your hours will vary because even though you might be getting off at 5, if there's anything that's asleep, in the back, you take over those cases. So you, know, you can have much longer hours with anesthesia, but still very rewarding. And then, but with internal medicine, now that I work in this department, my hours are from eight to five um, with an hour lunch break. So it's much, it's much easier for me to work those kind of hours. Um, so yeah, and you most of the time get off on time. And having weekends off and holidays off, it's, it is a blessing, so. So that's Monday through Friday then mm -hmm. with Yep, them. Monday through Friday. And then the second question is, what did you do in high school to prepare for veterinary technician school in this career? Yeah, okay, so um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was um, becoming a senior in high school, but I had been volunteering at, in the summer at a vet clinic, just letting dogs in and out to go potty and playing with them, um, and so because it was for a boarding facility. So I did that, and I thought I wanted to become a veterinarian, and I did a um, summer-long shadowing with a vet clinic. And after those, after those three months of shadowing, I realized I enjoyed being with the technicians more than I really enjoyed what the veterinarian was doing. Yes, I, it was <laughs> veterinarians are amazing, and I look up to them so much, but I'm a very hands-on person when it comes to um, drawing blood, sending out diagnostics, helping the animals feel more comfortable with their environment. Um, and so I personally, I knew I was going to become a veterinary technician um, after that summer. And so that's when I started looking into programs. Where is the closest one to me? Which program has really good ratings? And what's more hands-on? Um, there's a lot of veterinary technician programs that are online. And some people have amazing abilities to just focus on a computer and get through school. But me, personally, I'm very hands-on. Um, I need to see a patient and, and um, I need to see things up close, like on a scope, to really obtain, the, obtain that and take it with me into my career. So that's why I chose a school that was very um, Monday through Friday um, classroom oriented. And how tough was it to get into veterinary technician school? Oh, it, it, it wasn't tough at all. Um, you, you take a couple tests pre-hand so they know where you're kind of at. Um, with your like math and writing, but other than that, you can jump right into technician school, or excuse me, the technician school I went to, you can jump right in after you've taken these tests, and they will categorize you on which path you should, be, you should go on and what classes you'll take next, so. Are all veterinary technician schools accredited? Do they all lead to um, you being a, is it 
certified or licensed? Yeah, or? so um, every state is different. Like Colorado, for example, where I went to school, you take the national exam. So yes, you you graduate with your associates of technology of um, animals science, but you have to take a national exam afterwards to become nationally licensed. Where in, in Colorado, you're called a certified veterinary technician, whereas in Texas, you're called a licensed technician. And that you, you all take the same national-wide na uh, national test, excuse me, but afterwards, depending on what state you live in, you'll be called a different type of license. But after you've taken that national exam, and then you've taken your state exam, which state exams, <coughs> some states have them, and some states don't. So um, you have to, it kind of varies where you go to school. And after you've taken both those two exams, if you're in Texas, you have to take them both, you then become a licensed technician, which then you have to, um, every year, you have to do so many community continuing educational hours to uh, make sure you're renewing your license every year. It's just to help further your knowledge and to make sure that you're keeping on track with, with your license and things like that. Some of these pictures you had different uniforms on, mm -hmm. different colors. So do they mean anything? No. Um, a lot of, um, at Texas A&M, I should say, you can wear your whatever scrubs you want and whatever color scrubs you want. So there's no set in stone, which I kind of like. Um, but I used to work at a clinic in Colorado where you did have to wear the same color scrub every single day. So it really depends where you work and um, what their regulations are. You started rescuing animals when, and how do you know how many animals you can handle? Oh my gosh, great question. Um, I don't know, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that I turned 18 and moved out and I wasn't allowed to have a dog. I was always allowed to have 4-H um, animals like rabbits and, um, and I had a cat growing up and horses, but I was never allowed a dog because it was a lot of responsibility, my mom always said. Um, so finally, I turned 18 and got um, my first dog from the clinic I worked at and did my, um, my three month long shadow with. They had a dog come in that um, the owners just Get, uh, relinquished to the hospital and no longer wanted him and so I took him on and that's my border collie blue healer mix his name's Oakley and so he's my first dog and then I applied or yeah I applied to technician school in Colorado and we took the move together me and him and when I got to Colorado I worked at a um, clinic there while I was going to school and during my time there um, a kitty came in and um, it was a little girl's kitty, and the mom found out that the girl was highly allergic to cats. And so um, she no longer wanted that cat when she, after she brought it into the clinic. And so, of course, I thought, well, I don't have a cat, and I like cats, so I took on that kitty so I didn't have to go to the shelter. And then uh, four or five months later, working at the same clinic in Denver, um, a hit-by-car cat or kitty came in, and his name was Winston and um, he had a broken pelvic, broken ribs, and a broken jaw, and he wasn't in very good shape, but them, so the owners relinquished him instead of euthanizing him because um, one of the doctors there was an orthopedic, wanted to become an orthopedic specialist doctor, and so he performed these um, surgeries on, on Winston to see if he would make it through and to get more um, cases under his belt, and Winston overcame all of the surgeries and um, so two and a half months later, he finally left the hospital um, and um, being able to finally walk. And uh, so he's been with me for now three and a half years and he is the happiest go lucky kitty ever. He's not a big fan of going outside anymore. So, but, um, so that's how I have both my cats. Uh, and then my other dog, I recently got about eight months ago, my Irish Wolfhound. And he came in through the hospital and he was born with a PSS. It's a portal systemic shunt, and it's kind of in basic terms. It's a large vessel that um, is on that grows on the liver, and what happens is it, it it causes the liver to not form and work properly. So it pushes a lot of ammonia back into the blood system, and that can cause an animal to have a decreased lifespan, and also it can um, it it can cause them to have seizures and things like that if you don't monitor the ammonia with proper medication and prescription diet, because they can't have very high protein diets um, because that causes more ammonia in the blood system. So um, Buckley, my Irish Wolfhound, when he was diagnosed with this at three months old when he came in, the owner 
was very devastated and um, was trying to find him a home. And I was trying to help her find him a home, but in the end, he ended up just staying with me at my home. So, um, so he's become part of the family as well. And he actually um, had his surgery to help with his PSS um, about two months ago. And he is going to start eating um, regular dog food within the next three weeks. We're going to see how he does on it. But he's doing very well. And a great, again, he's another story of an animal that just needed a home and he's doing really good. So, and then luckily my horse, he's been with me for a very long time. Um, my mom rescued him from an auction um, years ago, probably 18 years ago. And so um, his story isn't as too in depth, but still. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I've gotten all of my animals. And trust me, if you become a technician, you will have multiple animals as well. You will always say you're not going to take any more, you don't need any more, but you always find a little bit more room in your house and you always find a little bit more money to buy that food. <laughs> so. What was your most interesting case? What's been your most interesting oh, case? Oh, man. Um, interesting case, interesting case. Well, well um, one case that was real nerve-wracking as the technician to watch it and as the veterinarian I'm sure very nerve-wracking was when um, we got a phone call to on a dog that was coming in through emergency and it had um, eaten a bunch of fish hooks out of the ta tackle box from his owner's garage and so his stomach and um, esophagus was full of fish hooks and we didn't know if we were going to be able to pull out safely all of the fish hooks without tearing anything and having to go in surgically or risking the patient's life. So uh, we get the patient anesthetized and we get him into endoscopy and we slowly start to work our way down with our scope and we start to see where the fish hooks are hooked in at and where they lie and we slowly start pulling these fish hooks out of the stomach and things like that and when you pull them out as you're coming out you have to worry about which hook is going to hit which side of the wall and slowly maneuvering it to stay into the middle as you come all the way out. So um, that was a very nerve-wracking experience to see um, this, this poor puppy with all these fish hooks in him. And um, he had a full recovery and did really well. But it was a couple hours of your stomach being clenched really hard, hoping that nothing goes wrong at any moment. So that was a very interesting case. So you were afraid of hooking the esophagus yes, on the way out. Yes, I was afraid of hooking it even more. Um, so yeah, that's just one. But there's there's so many things that you get to see on a daily basis. I've we pulled multiple rocks out of stomachs before. Um, dogs love those things. I don't know why. Um, we pulled um, rubber pieces out of stomach from them shredding up their toys, um, and then of course we get those scary um, chicken bones in dogs all the time. That, the owners come home and their and their whole roasted chickens off the oven and the dogs eating every bone and you've got to go in and pull out all those bones and stuff. So you see a, see a lot of those kind of cases. What advice do you have for students who are interested in becoming veterinary technicians? Um, don't be scared of of not getting in or or if it'll be too hard or anything like that. Um, if you have um, <coughs> If you have the desire and drive to want to work with animals, this is the career for you. Um, I absolutely loved um, the two-year technician program I went to. And I know there's a lot out there that people love as well. And after two years, you get to take on your career and you get to go with it. And you can you can go work on elephants in Thailand and become a technician. You can go all over the world. You, um, every hospital needs technicians, so you're, there's never a short short amount of jobs open, they're worldwide and you can work anywhere. You can go to Florida and work on dolphins. That's what one of my good friends are doing from tech school. And um, you can work in shelter medicine. You can um, you can work in general practice playing. You can just do vaccines on puppies. I mean, there's so many things you can do in this career and you, um, you never get bored. If you are working in one department for 10 years, transfer to another one and spice it up. I mean, there's always so much to do as a veterinary technician. It's, um, I, I physically can, um, or <laughs> I can say that I never work a day in my life because I full-heartedly love my job and after two years of education, I knew I was done and ready to start, start rolling, so. 
Have you been bitten before and do you have to take certain kind of shots to prevent uh, any problem? Um, well, you just have your basic, I have been bitten before, um, not by a cat, thankfully, knock on wood, um, yet, but I mean, I'm sure it'll happen sooner or later. But um, you, of course, you have to stay up to date on your tetanus shots. And if you do get bit by a cat, or I've been bit by a dog even now that I think about it. So not hard enough to where I've had to go to the clinic or the veter or not the veterinary hospital, <laughs> the regular hospital, and have to get put on antibiotics or anything like that. Um, but I do know that if you are bit by any animal, you are encouraged or forced to go to the hospital, get antibiotics, or at least have a doctor see it and see what they recommend. Um, but yeah, I think just your basic tetanus shot is all I have on board, and that's it. Nothing for rabies. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, rabies. <laughs> you do. You do a set of, um, and I don't know. I know that the school I went to, you um, you didn't have to have a rabies shot, and then. If the clinic you worked at in general practice, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't believe you had to have it for that clinic. But I know for academics wise at Texas a and where I work at now, you do have to have all your rabies shots on board. And that is a set of three shots over a three months period. And then you just check your tigers after that um, every couple years. And so, um, yes, yeah, so you do have to have your rabies in some areas. One of our students would like to know why dogs can't eat chicken bones. Hi dogs can't eat chicken bones. Um, so chicken chicken bones are very friable, and they when they break they break in bunch bunch of little pieces and they're very sharp. And so um, as they start to decompose in that stomach with the acids, they'll slowly start to break apart, meaning they're going to become very very sharp in the stomach. And when the stomach starts pushing it through the duodenum and the small intestinal tract, um, it's gonna it could potentially um, puncture all the way down, causing a very big problem in a surgical um, emergency very fast with chicken bones. So it's so, not a very stir sturdy bone. So uh, chicken bones uh, fragment and mm -hmm. they become sharps as opposed to other bones which uh, is more difficult to fragment. Yes, I believe so. I mean, <coughs> don't textbook me on that, but I've heard them talk multiple times about chicken bones and them being more friable. So. Uh, they'd like to know what the pros and cons of a private practice, a clinic, yeah. versus a teaching hospital like where you're at now. Oh yeah, um, great question. So I worked in general slash emergency for two years before I came to Texas A&M. And um, some of the pros and cons to each is, um, in general practice, you get to know your patient's owners and really well. They kind of become family at some point because you see them every couple months coming in for maybe um, a checkup or vaccines or you know if they have multiple animals you're going to see them multiple times so you kind of um, form these relationships with these owners and um, and their pets so um, I do miss that because in academics you form relationships with the veterinary students and the doctors we don't um, usually get to see very much of the owners because we're in the back taking care of patients and helping the students and the veterinarians and the students are talking to the owners, updating them on their patient and things like that. So it's much more of um, not much owner interaction in academics for a technician it feels like. But every department's different. So maybe in other departments, technicians get to work more with owners, but in internal medicine, we don't get too much of interaction with the owners. But in general practice, you do. You get a lot more interaction. Um, another thing with um, general practice is you, um, you get to take samples from the patient and you get to look under scopes with those samples if the doctors want to see what the blood looks like, platelets and things like that, or if they want to see after, like I said, after taking a skin sample, they want to see what that sample looks at under the scope. Um, they rely on you to have that educational background to be able to identify what you're looking at, at under the scope. And even though they might want to double check you, they trust you enough to, you know, your judgment is important and you know, it's very much appreciated in general practice whereas in academics everything you do is appreciated but you, everything is specialized so in academics you take that sample and you send it up to a lab or you send it to a pathologist or you send it out so you're um, you don't work you don't look under scopes very often um, you don't
you don't, you don't do those kind of basic diagnostics that you might do in general practice because general practice might not be able to afford to send out um, a slide or something like to that area. Um, they might just need to look at it and be able to, their best knowledge, diagnose what it is. Whereas in academics, we want the answer and uh, we're going to send it out to as many different labs as we need to to see if we can get an answer on that, spe on that um, specimen. So. So, so if you're in general uh, practice mm -hmm. uh, and someone owned a cat and dog, you knew them very, very nicely, mm -hmm. and then uh, all of a sudden they showed up with a gerbil. Oh, uh, yeah. What would you tell them about a pet ownership responsibility or whatever with a gerbil, which um, is maybe different from the other animals that they had? Uh, okay, so a gerbil. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, um, there, there must be books or something that yeah, tell you there's, uh, there's food lots and of books. <laughs> there's, t there's specific types of gerbil food, and I'm sure um, after you go through tech school and you take um, exotics, for example. They will go over different types of feeding and like how much vitamin C or vitamin K or something like that each species needs, like gerbils or birds or something like that. Um, and so you'll kind of have that knowledge and you'll be able to share it with the owners. And um, you know, just basic, I would have to update my own skills on a gerbil, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, you um, there's books to read and they're, um, so just, Things like that, I think, would be the best way to go about that. That's a good question. That was a stumper. <laughs> so. Who records uh, charges because each procedure is associated yeah. with a charge? Uh, the, the, the technicians record all the charges. So <laughs> while everything, all the procedures being taken place, um, we're, make, we're keeping track of what's being used, and we put in all the charges, and then also the veterinarians will be putting in charges too if they see something that we, made a, we might have missed. But most of the time, it's the technicians. I think we're about out of time now. We again, we thank you so much for being here with us today, Mary, and for sharing all the knowledge you have about veterinary technicians, what they do, and and how you become one. And if you would like to know more about uh, fields in uh, veterinary science, careers, things you can do, you're welcome to log on to our website. It's peer p e e r dot T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. And we look forward to having you here for our next presentation. Thanks Bye. so much.